Well, good evening to everybody, those who are here, as well as those joining us on the live stream. <coughs> Excuse me. If you would, let's go ahead and grab our Bibles. Let's go to the book of Malachi, uh, the book that we started looking at on Sunday as our uh, typical pattern is. We're going to dive a little bit deeper in it here, and the reason I wanted to do it specifically tonight is the opening verses of Malachi set the entire tone for the rest of the book. It's God's love for Israel that's going to drive his warning and even his discipline for his people. See, because God loves and his people and desires the best for his people, when you and I don't walk according to his ways, in love he warns and he disciplines us and by obeying God we become holy and we stand out from the world around us which ultimately glorifies God which is why he disciplines his children. So tonight we want to look at this. What is our role as a Christian in a post-Christian nation? And in order to do this honestly we're not even going to make it past the first verse but let's look at it together. Malachi chapter 1 verse 1 it says this the burden of of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for this opportunity to study your word. And God, I pray that you would open our ears and our hearts to receive your truth. That, Father, we would understand uh, how we are to glorify you with our life. In Jesus' name, amen. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Now, when we ask the question, what are we today to be? We are to be a prophet. Now, Malachi is a prophet of God. He is one of the 12 minor prophet uh, books there in the Old Testament that, that close it out there. Uh, when we talk about a minor prophet, we're not talking about um, a diminished value. Rather, we're talking about a shorter book. Now, you and I are to be prophets, but the New Testament is going to use a different word. It's a word found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, and it's this, that we are to be an ambassador, okay? Look at it there. It says, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled. To God. Now, when we ask the question, what does a prophet do? There are really two things. First, they call people back to God uh, through obedience. All right, James 4:17 tells us that our faith will be demonstrated by our obedience. We call people back to God through evangelism, by the sharing of the gospel. And we share with people that the only way they can be right with God is to trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, right? Now, Paul says an ambassador for, as an ambassadors for Christ, we're given the, the message or the ministry of reconciliation. To reconcile is to bring into agreement two opposing parties. Uh, it's kind of an accounting term. Uh, think about, now I know we don't do this as much today in the a uh, day and age of electronic banking or online banking. Um, but there, there was a time, okay, in which people would get a paper statement and they would grab their checkbook and they would look at their uh, paper bank statement and they would try to match them up. They would reconcile the checkbook. Why? Because the official document, the, the bank statement, was the true and accurate record. And so the, the checkbook had to be reconciled or brought into agreement with what the bank says. Because I can say I have a million dollars. If the bank says I have five dollars, guess which one's right? The bank, right? So it, it, understanding it in this term, okay, it is God who is holy. It is we who are morally bankrupt in sin. Therefore, we have to be reconciled to God. Now, the second thing that you see here on the screen, a prophet would deliver a message about the coming Messiah. Now, um, our message today is a little bit different than Malachi's message. Malachi's message was the Messiah is coming. 
Our message today is the Messiah will one day return. Now, what motivates our evangelism is obedience, but also the knowledge that Jesus is going to return one day. And when he returns, the time of grace will be over. It will then be a time of judgment. Now, I think there's one thing that you and I need to understand tonight about when we talk about the, the life of a prophet. It is a very hard life. Uh, do you remember what the prophet Jeremiah's nickname was? It was, of course, the weeping prophet. This was a man who year after year preached the word of God, and he saw nobody converted. Nobody trusted in what he said or, or in God. He's broken for God's people. He shared God's message, but they refused to listen. Now, let's be honest. You and I need to expect this at times, all right? We, we need to understand, especially in a post-Christian nation, I know a lot of people don't like hearing that, okay? I, I'm not trying to be mean or, or antagonistic, but I believe we have to be very honest looking at, at our own nation, okay? Um, we, we are a, living in a post-Christian time right now. Now, what I want to say is there's two reasons that you and I should not be discouraged by this. The, the first one, okay, is found, let me go back here a, a little bit. I jumped myself here, all right. The, the first one is this, that God has promised to save some. Okay? God has promised to save some. Now, what we're looking at here is, and I'm going to get it pulled up, it's John 6, 37. All right? It's where Jesus says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. All right, here's the greatest thing, and I said it on, on Sunday. Nobody who genuinely has this desire to come to God will be turned away. Nobody's going to be saved on accident, but rather it will be because the sovereign God has elected them before the time began, and now he is drawing them and convicting them of their sin so that they come to Jesus. Okay, so all that the Father gives me. So what we see is the church is a gift from the Father to the Son because of his sacrifice. And the promise that him that cometh to me, I will in the wise cast out. Jesus says, listen, you come to me in faith. I'm not going to cast you out. I'm not going to turn you away. So we don't want to be discouraged when we go and share the gospel and, and people continue to reject and reject and reject. Because we have this promise. God, not everybody's going to be saved, but God has promised he is going to save some. All right? The second reason that we should be discouraged is this. That our uh, success or failure does not depend, it won't be judged by how many people trust Christ as we share the gospel. Rather, our success or failure will depend on our faithfulness to share the gospel in the first place. Okay? Listen, you, you might be Jeremiah. i, I got to be honest. There are times that you just, I, I share the gospel and share the gospel and share the gospel. And it seems like nobody says anything. You know, nobody's responding. And as long as I remember, my success is not in their salvation, but rather in my faithfulness to share, then it gives me the ability to continue on and go, you know what? Every no brings us that much closer, hopefully, to a yes. Now, we were to be a prophet or, or an ambassador for Christ. But what is, our prophet, what is a prophet's role? It is to speak the word of God. Look again how Malachi starts. The burden of the word of the Lord. Malachi wasn't sharing his opinion or his thoughts on the state of Israel. What he is sharing is the very word of God. In fact, as an ambassador, we are only authorized to share what God has said. My role as a pastor isn't to entertain you. It's not to be the smartest person in the room. It's not to transfer information 
to you. My responsibility is to share with you what God has said privately, and I must declare it publicly. Okay, so as a pastor, as a teacher, pours over and prays over a text, their responsibility when it's time to deliver it is to simply say what God has said. The same is true when you share the gospel. You're to share the truth of Scripture with them. Allow the Holy Spirit to do His work of conviction, drawing, saving, and strengthening. Now again, remember, the life of an ambassador is not an easy one. Sinful men will not want to, they will not readily accept the Word of God. Think back to when you were unsaved. Did you like to hear the gospel? Did you like to hear the truth of Scripture? Of course not. The only way that we can ever understand Scripture is the Spirit of God teaches us the Word of God. And that's evidenced in 1 Corinthians 2, 14 there. But it's why it's so vital for you and I as Christians to live a different life than the world around us. We live in a skeptical world. We have to earn the right to speak into somebody's life. Now, 20, 30 years ago, pastors, Christians, churches, they were respected places. They were respected people. But in this post-Christian nation, that's just not the case. And honestly, we've brought a lot of it on ourselves. Pastors, Christians, we have lived hypocritically. Uh, we, we, We have not shown any difference in ourselves from the rest of the world. And so the world's like, why should I listen to you? Why should I believe this message? It can't even change you. And so you and I need to strive to live a holy called out life that is different than the world, Romans 12, 1 and 2, to be in the world but not to live like the world. Now, we're not going to be perfect. We're going to fall short of the glory of God every single day. And so when that happens publicly, what we need to do is we need to own it and we need to confess it. The worst thing we could do is just deny it or, or downplay it. You know, if we said or did something in front of somebody that that was not Christian, it's on us to go back to them and go, you know what, what I said, what I did, it was wrong, and and I'm sorry. You know, Scripture says it's a sin, and and I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry. Now, that's really difficult to do, but let me tell you something. When you and I live that, quote-unquote, authentic life in front of them, it gives credibility to our words And so God can use even our shortcomings to point people to his glory and his grace in the gospel. Now, I want you to notice the the word that Malachi uses in 1.1. He says, the burden. Some of your translations say, the oracle of God. This is a message of impending doom. That's what this word means means it's potential judgment is coming malachi is going if you do not repent of your sin what i'm telling you is what god is going to bring on you the amazing thing about the book of malachi is this even in god's message of judgment we find mercy because we're going to see later on as we progress through the book on sundays we're going to see john the baptist uh, prophesied we're going to see jesus prophesied uh, about but it's important for you and i to see how malachi's message is crossing over with our message today we shouldn't get into discussions about when jesus is going to come back but we definitely need to tell people jesus is going to return the fact that jesus rose from the dead changes everything okay we should share with them that god is giving us time right now he's giving us grace to repent but there is going to come a time in which he returns and then grace ends and judgment will have come sharing the reality of hell is actually a sign of loving somebody it's not fear mongering it's not hate speech as a lot of people want to characterize it fact of the matter we do the unsaved no favors by not sharing with them the truth about eternity and their eternal destiny if they die having rejected Jesus. So let me ask you something. Who's your one? 
Who's that person? Are you praying for them every single day to be saved? Have you shared the gospel with them? If not, are you making a plan to share the gospel with them? Remember, our love for God is seen in our obedience to God. And he has told us to share the gospel. He's told us to go make disciples of all nations. Now, there are a lot of people who want to share the gospel, but they're not really sure how to. And let me just say, there are a lot of different ways that you can do it. There's faith evangelism, we've taught here. Uh, there's way of the master, evangelism explosion. Um, more than a carpenter, uh, the Romans road. There's, there's a plethora of ways. One that's uh, put out by the North American Mission Board is called the Three Circles. Uh, Method has got a free app that you can download on Apple or Android. Uh, by the way, it's, it's a really good way uh, to do it. Uh, but if you would, please allow me to share uh, one of the methods that I use probably the most often one, uh, and it's because it's the simplest. What makes this the simplest method of uh, sharing scriptures, I don't have to remember some outline. Uh, what I have to remember is scripture. Okay? Um, so what I like to do is I like to start with an open-ended question. Something along the lines of, what do you think happens when we die? Or do you believe in a literal heaven and hell? Now, kind of be honest, I've never met the person that doesn't have an opinion on those things. They, I mean, they, they've, got a, they've got an opinion on what happens uh, after we die. Or, uh, you know, is there life after death? Um, another question I, I like to ask you is, is this one. How do you think everything in this world came to be? I mean, or, you know, I mean, have you, did you see that gorgeous sunrise? How do you think it happened? Where did it come from? Or that sunset? Yeah, those type of open-ended questions, because what it's going to do is it's going to open up an opportunity to share the gospel. And so the, the way I, I like to do it is something along these lines. You know, the Bible tells us that God created everything in the world, and he created it perfectly. God created Adam and Eve. He, he's created us. Now, he told Adam and Eve, you know, you can eat from any tree in this garden except one. The day you eat of that tree, you're, you're going to die. You know, the reality, uh, have you ever had somebody in your family or a, a close friend die? Yeah, I have too. You know what? Death is proof that what the Bible said is, is true because God said, you rebel against me, there's going to be death. So, I mean, we, we've both experienced that reality because we've lost uh, somebody. And, you know, just like Adam, you and I have sinned. And, and because of that, we are the enemies of God. But because of who God is, because of his love and, and his grace, he sent his son Jesus to die in our place. And because Jesus died in our place, God's wrath towards sin has been satisfied. That, that penalty has been paid. And, and so God made a way for you and I to have our sins forgiven, for us to be saved, and for us to know that we can spend all of eternity with him. And that way is by placing our faith in him and trusting in, in what Jesus did. It's not about what I do. It's about what Jesus has has done and and when I place all my faith, that's my hope and my trust in Jesus, then I have a relationship with him. And you know, we know that there's life after death because Jesus rose from the dead. So that means there's more to life than, than what we see and what we experience are around us. Because Jesus is alive, he offers us salvation, forgiveness, and, and eternal life. But he also tells us that if we reject him because we're his enemies, because we sin against him, we're going to be separated from, for all of eternity from God in a place called the lake of fire. Now, I'm grateful that God has saved me. And I believe that he would say that he can save you. Have you received God's grace? Would you like to? It's about two to three minutes. Now, 
remember I said it comes out of Scripture. You're probably like, well, I didn't hear you quoting a bunch of Bible verses. Um, but hopefully you heard the Bible all throughout it. Because all throughout that gospel presentation, it, it goes from creation to the cross to the offer. Okay? And that's really what we're trying to do. Now, what, where did I learn this method? Believe it or not, not in Bible college. I learned it from Jesus. Luke 24, verse 27 says this, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. This is Resurrection Sunday. Uh, Jesus is walking on the road with two disciples. They're on the Emmaus Road. And, and Jesus has been talking to them, um, though they don't recognize that it is Jesus. But it said, once he revealed himself to them, he begins at Moses. What's that mean? He begins with the first five books of the Bible, which begin with what? Genesis and creation. So when Jesus shared the truth about himself, he started in creation and he came all the way through the cross to uh, an understanding that he is the fulfillment of the promise to send a redeemer. Now, let me ask you something. What happens if the person you're sharing with professes to be a Christian. Now, while we want to thank God and praise God, we want to probe a little bit. We want to make sure that they're a Christian. Not that we're the judge, but because we love God and we love them, we want to make sure they don't have a false assurance of their salvation, right? So I, I typically like to ask two questions. By the way, Sterling can tell you these are the same two questions I ask him. I ask them of anybody when it comes to salvation, the first question is this. Why does a person need to be saved? The second question is, how is a person saved? Now, I'm specifically looking for two things. Number one, I want the word sin to be mentioned somewhere in their answer to number one. And I want them to mention through Jesus alone, somewhere, somehow, in the answer to number two. Why? Why am I looking for those things specifically? Because a lot of people will answer the question number one this way. Well, I want to go to heaven when I die. Or I, I want to be with Jesus. Or I want to see my loved ones again. Now, those are good reasons to want to be in heaven. But they are not explanations for why we need to be saved. The reason we need to be saved is because we have sinned against a holy God and therefore we have an outstanding debt that has to be paid. It's either been paid by Jesus or it will be paid by us. I'm looking for faith alone in Jesus in a second because that's what Scripture teaches from Genesis to Revelation. That it's belief in this Messiah that God has sent as the way to be saved. So instead of just taking somebody's word, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, or you know, I, I believe in Jesus, you know, we want to probe a little bit deeper. Because unfortunately, a lot of people know the right answer, or, or know an answer to give, oh, oh yeah, I, I want to go to heaven when I die. Well, who doesn't? I mean, if I have to choose heaven or hell, that's a pretty simple choice. It, even a hardened atheist would go, yeah, no thanks. To hell, right? But I want to probe deeper because I can't think of anything worse than someone going through their entire life believing that they're actually a Christian when they're not. That would be one of the most unloving things. And, and so sometimes I risk offending people. Sometimes I've, I've risked offending you guys because... I ask those questions, not because I'm holier than you, not because I, I'm somebody's judge, but because I don't want to stand before God knowing I'm giving an account for, for how I've led you. I don't want to stand before him not having loved him and you enough to ask you the questions that need to be asked. And that's got to be our motivation for asking other people these questions yeah they might get upset 
But hey, as long as they give the right answers, that's okay. The ones that I'm the most concerned about are the ones that are, uh, again, they think they're right with God, but, but they're not. We want, to convey, we want to convey God's message because as an ambassador, that's what we've been called to do. We're not called to live for ourselves. We're called to live for Jesus Christ. So again, I want you to ponder. Why does a person need to be saved? It's because of sin. How is a person saved? By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Is that what you believe? Is that what you believe for those of you watching this live stream? If not, or if you want to know more, I want to encourage you, please reach out to me, Pastor Justin at westlakebaptist.org. Or if you're here, please pull me aside or, or make an appointment. Let's, let's meet in the office. Let's talk about this. Because we want to know that we're right with God because he has made the way for that to happen. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for this opportunity to study your word. And God, I pray that we would take our role as an ambassador